right, here we are. We've made it to part three of our series on the history of sociology. Um, this section is going to focus on the fathers of sociological theory. Remember part one looked at the origins of sociology and how that came out of the Industrial Revolution. Part two looked at our sort of founders of sociology, right, those folks living during the Industrial Revolution that, that agreed, yeah, we should probably study this. And now we're going to get to those folks associated with the theories Right, these tools we use to interpret information that we're going to talk a lot more about on Tuesday. So let's start with the father, quote unquote, that we're probably most familiar with, Karl Marx. If you look at his dates, again, very much living during the Industrial Revolution. He was famous for hanging out in these new factories and watching people and seeing you know, how it changed their lives. Um, but most people know Karl Marx for his association with communism. And, We'll get to that in just a moment, um, but we get to claim him um, in sociology as well um, because of his interest in how the Industrial Revolution changed people's behavior. Now you'll notice the purpose of sociology, um, very similar to Comte and um, some folks we talked about earlier, that the purpose of sociology is not just to study um, the effects of the Industrial Revolution, but to figure out how do we fix some of the problems that came about or got worse because of the Industrial Revolution. So he's a very hands-on guy, right? How do we make things better? These three theorists that we're going to talk about too also have very different perspectives, right? Marx is what was called a materialist, right? The root of this word is material, meaning things. So when we say Marx was a materialist, what we're saying is he's arguing things influence our behavior all these things in our lives and he's he's on to something here right cars for example profoundly shaped people's behavior it literally made their worlds bigger right they could move around more it impacted who they married and where they lived and what kind of religious beliefs they they held on to or cell phones more contemporary example right imagine ways that cell phones haven't had an impact on our behavior so when we say a materialist we're talking about things influencing behavior, and, and this should make sense, right? During the Industrial Revolution, we have this explosion of things, of material things, and Marx was sitting there watching and seeing how they changed how people lived their lives. But why specifically are we talking about Marx? Well, it's because of his association with conflict theory. Now, we're going to get into the nuts and bolts of conflict theory on Tuesday, but I wanted to spend a little bit of time about why Marx is associated with this specific theory. And it's based on his critique of capitalism, right? He argued that this new sort of economic system, capitalism, created immense amount of conflict between what he called the capitalists and the proletariat. So let's back up. So prior to capitalism, we had what was called sort of a feudal economic system, right? It looked kind of like this, right? It was this two-tiered system where you had the elite on top, you had your serfs on the bottom. Now the primary characteristic of feudal systems is that they lacked social mobility. There was no moving up, no moving down, right? So if you were born some poor serf in your little hovel, didn't matter how smart you were, didn't matter how hard you worked, you were not moving up, and the reverse was true. If you were born a fancy elite person, didn't matter how lazy you were, how stupid you were, there was little chance of you moving down. Right? So no social mobility. Well, capitalism comes along and has this promise of social mobility. All of a sudden, wow, if you work hard and you apply yourself, you too can move up. Right? So there was a lot of excitement about capitalism, right? challenging social inequality. Well, Marx throws a big wet blanket on that excitement. He says, hold on, wait a minute, this whole capitalist system is just the old system with fancy new wrapping paper. Right? He argued that really, there is very little or no social movement between what he called your capitalists or your bourgeoisie or your sort of workers, what he called your proletariat. So follow me here. So the idea is if there, he argued that capitalism absolutely depended on a large group of cheap labor, right? So if there really was all that social mobility that they promised, there'd be lots of proletariat moving up and the whole system would fall apart. Right? So he argued, no, this is just same old cruddy system that, that we've always had and we need to challenge it and we need to seriously question um, how useful it is. Now, when I was shown, um, there's the film A Bug's Life that people might be familiar with and I remember watching this with my son many moons ago and his friend asked me, he said, you know, there's so many more ants than there are grasshoppers in this film why don't the ants just kick out the grasshoppers and take over? And I said, you know, that's a good question. And it really, poor thing, I launched into a, a discussion on communism with them. 
but it's a very Marxist question, right? So let's think about Bug's Life, right? In Bug's Life, you've got your mean grasshoppers, your sort of bourgeoisie, and you've got your ants, your proletariat, right, doing all the work for the greedy grasshoppers. Well, the answer to this poor kid's question is that these ants were suffering from what Marx called false consciousness, right? That they truly believed in the promise of capitalism, that the reason they were stuck in their crappy jobs is because they just weren't working hard enough or weren't applying themselves, right? This idea that, that it's your fault you're in your situation. But if you remember in Bug's life, at the end, they had this sort of aha moment where they realized, wait a minute, we're really smart ants, we're hardworking ants. Maybe the problem isn't with us, maybe the problem's with the system, what Marx called class consciousness, right? So his association with communism is that he was hoping that workers would come together and get, you know, move beyond false consciousness and have this aha class consciousness moment. So let's watch a clip from A Bug's Life to give you a sense of what I'm talking about. was that ant that stood up to me? Yeah, but we can forget about him. Yeah, it was just one ant. <laughs> <laughs> one ant. <laughs> yeah, you're right. It's just one ant. Yeah, boys, they're puny. Hmm, puny? Say, let's pretend this brain is a puny little ant. Did that hurt? <laughs> nope. Well, how about this one? Are you kidding? <laughs> well, how about this? You let one ant stand up to us, then they all might stand up. Those puny little ants outnumber us a hundred to one. And if they ever figure that out, there goes our way of life. It's not about food. It's about keeping those ants in line. That's why we're going back. I'm wrong. You're lower than dirt. You're an ant. Let this be a lesson to all you ants. Ideas are very dangerous things. You are mindless, soil-shoving losers. Put on this earth to serve us. You're wrong. are not meant to serve grasshoppers. I've seen these ants do great things. And year after year, they somehow manage to pick food for themselves and you. So, so who is the weaker species? Ants don't serve grasshoppers. It's you who need us. We're a lot stronger than you say we are. And you know it, don't you? <laughs> well, Princess. Um, Hopper, um, I, I hate to interrupt, but... Uh... You ain't stay back! This was such a bad idea. You see, Hopper, nature has a certain order. The ants pick the food, the ants keep the food, and the grasshoppers leave. <laughs> okay, so I'm not sure Disney set out to make a Marxist film, but I would argue it did, right? So, you write this tension between the, the proletariat, the capitalists, right? The, the, the capitalists trying to keep their stuff, the proletariat trying to get some stuff. Right? So hence Marx's association with conflict theory, right? This constant tension in society brought about 
by right, capitalism and the Industrial Revolution. Okay, so our next father of sociological theory, Max Weber, it looks like Weber, but it's Weber, German name, right? He's a contemporary of Marx, and there you're going to see some similarities, but some interesting differences here too, right? So like Marx, he thought the purpose of sociology was not only to understand the, the impact on, of industrialization and capitalism on people's lives, but really to, to fix a lot of the problems that came about because of it. Interesting difference, though, is remember Marx was a materialist, Weber's an idealist, but not in the sense that we think of idealism today. What we're talking about here is where Marx thought material things influenced social behavior, Weber thought ideas influenced social behavior. And that might seem like the same thing, but it's a little bit different, right? So, whereas Marx would say the actual cell phone changes our behavior, Weber would say it's the idea behind a cell phone, right? The idea that you're supposed to be able to be in touch at all times and have access to information at all times. Or like Marx would say the stuff that's being produced from, you know, the Industrial Revolution was changing people's behavior. Weber would say, no, it's not the actual stuff. It's the idea behind industrialization. It's the idea behind capitalism, right? The promise of social mobility. That's what keeps people doing what they're doing, right? Ideas versus things. I hope what's a little bit confusing is that they're both right, right? Ideas, things, both shape our behavior. Weber is associated with another theory that we're going to talk about, symbolic interactionism. And he's associated with this because of his focus on ideas. He said it's not really stuff, it's ideas, it's values, right? It's our opinions um, about things that really shapes our behavior. And where these values, where these ideas come from is through interaction with other people, right? So he, Marx sort of took the that's a big perspective on industrialization. Weber was much more interested in what happens in between interactions between people and groups, right? So again, we'll talk about this more, but it's an interesting um, theory to, to check out. Okay, last but not least, Emil Durkheim. Um, again, another father of sociological theory, another father of sociology, right? Watching the Industrial Revolution. But he's a little bit different than Marx and Weber, right? Whereas there, what the purpose of sociology was to help address the problems of industrialization. For Durkheim, the purpose of sociology is to explore how do societies stay together, right? In what way is the industrialization changing how people feel connected or don't feel connected, right? So he's really interested in sort of social glue, what keeps people together. He argued that before the industrialization, the glue that kept people together is what he called mechanical solidarity, right? That these sort of small pre-industrial societies, what kept them together is everyone was kind of on the same page, right? Everybody did the same jobs, right? Everybody's growing food, everybody's taking care of animals. Um, and because they were such small groups, everybody basically shared the same values, beliefs, opinions, right? So you had this sort of mechanical solidarity, everybody on the same page. Obviously, this starts to change after industrialization, right? Industrialization allowed societies to get much, much bigger, so the shared values isn't going to work anymore, right? You've got people with very different values, very different opinions. So, so what's the glue? What keeps them together? Durkheim argued organic solidarity. And what this means is basically what kept people together in these larger societies is economic dependence. Everybody's doing very specific jobs. You got one person growing food, one person taking care of the children, one person, you know, building steel to make buildings. So everybody's economically dependent on one another to survive, right? That sort of different kind of glue. So again, Durkheim's really interested in what keeps societies together. This, anomie, is a bad thing, according to Durkheim, right? Anomie is the opposite of when that glue starts to fall apart and people f start feeling disconnected from one another. Anomie um, raises an interesting question when we think about the internet, right? In what ways has the internet maybe contributed to anomie? People feeling disconnected, right? That glue kind of falling apart. And in what ways has the internet kept anomie at bay? In what ways has the internet kept us together, right? I served as sort of a glue. I think there's good arguments for both. Last but not least, Marx, um, sorry, Durkheim's perspective, he's a realist. Um, again, a little bit different context than what we think of realist today. He argued that there were sort of social facts, social reality out there affecting people's behavior, and the job of sociologists was to uncover those social facts. Just like there's natural laws that govern the natural world, there's social laws that govern the social world. 
But why are we talking about him? Well, he's the father of the last theory we're going to explore, structural functionalist theory. We'll talk about this a lot, but basically this is the idea that society is made up of these interdependent institutions, right? Just like the body's made up of different systems, society's made up of different social institutions. Okay, so that about wraps it up. We'll keep talking about theory on Tuesday.